both those things are gone. <laughs> like, um, you know, economically speaking, uh, Germany is uh, pretty much destroyed. It needs to rethink its uh, entire economic uh, model. If you look at, uh, you know, the uh, the trends of the German economy, it's, um, it's catastrophically bad. Um, and France's voice uh, in terms of, uh, of diplomacy is, uh, is gone. It's, uh, we don't exist anymore. Maybe we can use this now to shift gears a little bit and talk in this second segment about uh, a bit more about Europe also and, and the European politics, which you also publish on Twitter. Um, for everybody, I'm still talking to Arnaud Bertrand, the prolific um, writer and political analyst on Twitter. Everybody, um, please follow him and just look up his name. It's going to be down in the description, of course. Um, Arnaud, in the first part, we talked about China and, and misrepresentations. Maybe we can now talk about, uh, you know, what happens, what's right happening right now in Europe, that we have an unstable, uh, like, political situations in, in several places. I'm quite fascinated at France, actually. Um, and we have a war going on that can still escalate. And right now, the talk is that the US and the UK will okay uh, using long-range missiles against uh, any any part of Russia. And that would mean not just Ukraine using it because they don't have the intelligence to do so, ni neither can, nor can they operate these, these weapons, which means that it would be NATO personnel doing basically everything. And Vladimir Putin just so much has said that that's how they will interpret it, if they will interpret this as a NATO attack. Um, yeah. What do you think about that situation? So... First of all, on this uh, long-range missile thing, the one thing that struck me the, the most is um, that, uh, as you said, it's the US and UK foreign secretary that went there, and there was no one from Europe. That's quite crazy when you think about it, because it, it's a decision that is uh, extremely, potentially extremely impactful for, for Europe. And there was no European voice uh, at the table, so so it it, it shows that something is uh, is uh, is really weird there, um, and it actually illustrates uh, how weak geopolitically speaking Europe is. Uh, that you know their voice don't even need to be at the table because it's assumed, I guess, uh, that you know they, they they just follow along uh, uh, faithfully. Yeah, but let's let, let's face it. That's what what the continental Europeans have been doing most, oh, yes. with the exception oh, yes. of France a bit. Yeah. And you know, it is the, the foreign minister of Poland. Uh, what's his name? Um, the, the the husband of Applebaum, right? He's, he's yeah, yeah, yeah. Applebaum. The guy who tweeted, the, who, who tweeted on uh, "Thank you, America." After, yeah, yeah. Thank you, um, thank you, USA. Yeah. Sikorsky. Can't remember his name. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he he even said like uh, they're they're pushing the UK and the US to do so, to give the OK. So there are Europeans that that very much want that escalation. But the, the, the two big ones, Germany and France, seem to be out of the picture. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite shocking, actually. I mean, uh, especially from my own country, France, given our political uh, uh, history, we used to be uh, you know, the diplomatic power in Europe, uh, the, that was actually the division between uh, between Germany and France. It was, Europe was meant to be led by the Franco-German couple, right? That's how we used to, uh, to call it, um, with uh, France running, you know, foreign affairs, diplomacy for uh, for Europe being like the external voice of, of Europe and uh, Germany um, being like the industrial economic uh, uh, power of, uh, of, of, of the continent. And uh, both those things are gone. <laughs> like, um, you know, economically speaking, uh, Germany is uh, pretty much destroyed. It needs to rethink its uh, entire economic uh, model. If you look at, uh, you know, the uh, the trends of the German economy, it's, um, it's catastrophically bad. 
Um, and France's vice uh, in terms of uh, of diplomacy is uh, is gone. It's uh, we don't exist anymore. Like I I, I I was listening this morning to Dominique de Villepin, uh, who uh, used to be France's prime minister, also fa famously our uh, foreign minister. Um, and, uh, you know, he's the guy who went to the UN uh, to oppose the war in, in Iraq. Uh, if you remember at the time of the presidency of, uh, of Jacques Chirac, and that's why, you know, at the time in the US, uh, French fries used to be called freedom fries and so on. Like, we used to have that, uh, that vice. And yesterday in the, in the, in the video that, uh, that I watched, he said, he literally said, our voice is gone. We don't exist diplomatically, uh, dip diplomatically anymore. It's over. Uh, so that's that. That's just that's just a fact. And uh, why is that the case? I think, first of all, because we joined NATO, we rejoined NATO uh, under Sarkozy, uh, the president who came after, after Chirac. We used to be out of NATO, having our completely independent uh, army, um, and uh, on the fact that you're in NATO, of course, implies that uh, you need to abide by the NATO line when it comes to, uh, you know, fighting NATO battle, battles and, and because uh, the U.S. is such uh, so disproportionately bigger in, in NATO than all the other countries, then basically uh, they're on the show. Uh, so that's one thing, and also you know Europe has uh, has taken a lot of, um, of of power from from states. <clears throat> um, there are a lot of uh, um, a, a lot of things that are just not run at the state level anymore in in Europe. Like we don't control uh, states, don't control their, their their currency anymore. They don't control their uh, their immigration policy. There are so many things that that are on the European level, meaning that uh, you know governments uh, basically, you know, are are really don't have the power that they they used to have anymore. Yeah, the the the, the European Union is a weird thing. It is more than just a customs union, but it is less than a proper nation state. But but at the moment, what we can see is at least ideologically, it manages to 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 exert quite a bit of force, right, toward the elites of the different countries. And maybe we can take France as an example here, because correct me if I'm wrong, but after what um, uh, uh, Mr. Macron did recently, first calling yeah. an election that was unnecessary, then making deals with the left breaking them, making a deal with the right and appointing a right, uh, a center right uh, uh, prime minister. And basically, I mean, now everybody must hate that dude, right? And his his mandate is over anyhow, going to be over anyhow. So the only political future he has, and he's too young to exit, is actually on, on the EU level. Isn't he eyeing the EU level and is basically already selling out France, just like, um, you know, Kaya Kallas did in Estonia or which one was she? She... Uh, Lithuania, Kaya Kalis. I think it's Estonia. I think Estonia, it's Estonia, right? Yeah. She was Estonian yeah, PM yeah. and then yeah. immediately ditched that once she got the 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 or the the promise of the position as the new uh, foreign yeah. uh, foreign policy chief of the EU. What do you make out of this kind of you know the EU as a as an instrument to to get the elites of the of the of local uh, na na nations? I think. Uh... That's probably correct, although uh, Macron was always uh, ideologically uh, very aligned with Europe. He's always run on uh, um, a very, very pro-European platform. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, he always displays, for instance, the European flag together with the, with the French flag. He, he, he makes a point of it uh, all the time. So he's, he's very, very pro-European, even when he ran as president where, where I don't think he could have had, you know, that long-term plan of, of maybe, uh, you know, uh, being hired at the European level afterwards. So I, I think there is a, a deep ideological uh, component of that in him, but specifically on, uh, on Barnier, uh, on his appointment of Barnier, I think that probably uh, played a role uh, because um, 
the alternative was, uh, of course, uh, nominating a prime minister from the winners of the election, uh, that new, new popular front, uh, who actually wanted to rock the boat quite a bit. Um, they wanted to undo a lot of uh, reforms from Macron. So, for instance, he, he had uh, made the retirement age uh, higher. Uh, they wanted to roll that back. They wanted to increase the minimum salary and so on. When France has a lot of tension right now with the EU because its budget deficit is, uh, is crazy high. We are approaching uh, 6%. Uh, which is double what you're normally allowed under under EU EU policy. Normally, you can't be more than than three um, percent. And so, I would think that uh, you know Macron was afraid of that and didn't want to displease uh, uh, Euro Europe, nominating uh, nominating the left because. He, he might have thought that this would worsen the, the deficit, uh, but of course that also means not respecting the sovereign choice of, uh, of the French people. They elected the left uh, first, right? Um, certainly, uh, well, they were the first party in terms of um, number of seats at the end. And certainly, they didn't want uh, Barnier, who only got five, uh, whose party only got five percent of the votes. That's the most crazy part of it. They're and, fourth. <laughs> they were fourth. He, he didn't have to do that election. That was his choice. He did yeah. it be because he said um, he's listening to the to the voice of the people, and because the word is EU elections, right? There were the EU elections, and and his party like did quite poorly. So he said, "I'm listening to the voice of the people. Tell me what you want." And then he actually actually gives them a big big middle finger, saying like, "I don't care after all. Yeah. You thought I." Yeah. Care. yeah exactly exactly it's uh it's it, it's it's completely crazy when you think about it and, and very very shocking and i think that we leave deep marks uh on france already we had a situation a bit like that with uh, if you remember we voted no to the 2005 referendum when it came to uh, the eu constitution um Meaning we didn't want uh, to give more powers to uh, to the EU. We didn't want the EU to have a, you know, constitution that uh, uh, that meant it it could take over a lot of powers from from states, and and so we voted no. And two three years later, we had the Lisbon Treaty that was done behind the French back, uh, the French back uh, that. Uh, Basically implemented all those changes that uh, that we voted no against, uh, and this is uh, spoken about all the time in France. Uh, and is seen, you know, everyone knows about that, and it's seen as a huge denial of uh, of, of democracy. But what Macron did is, uh, you know, far worse uh, because it's uh, you know, at least with the Lisbon Treaty, they they waited a few years after the no and so on, like. That's what Macron did was so bleak. Like you voted for those guys, I'm taking that guy. Yeah. So th that will uh, have profound uh, effects, I think. Yeah, yeah. It is. And but on the other hand, for, in order to do this, the, there's these. He probably had talks with Le Pen, right? So of course. why do you think Le Pen agreed to that? Doesn't this shine a bad light on her? Because he's the one you shouldn't touch at the moment in French politics, and she. Do you think th this might hurt her in the future, or or is this like good for her? I think that's a good question. I think it might hurt her because right. actually, what Barnier stands for is uh, everything against her as well, uh, because he's extremely pro EU, uh, right? Uh, he's from the uh, Republican right. They've always opposed the the Front National. Um, and he, people who vote for Le Pen right now are mostly, uh, you know, um, from uh, low-income people in France. It's when you look at our voters, it's uh, a lot of people in the countryside who are low-income. Uh, and you know, Barnier is is like the uh, caricature of uh, you know the the. the the guy born with the silver spoon in 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 the mouth, uh, the caricature of that 
aristocrat from from the right uh, who does everything for for the rich, right? Uh, so it's uh, it's 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 very much against uh, um, what a base would want. Uh, so I am also a bit puzzled by that. Indeed. And we we have a lot of these situations. I mean, Germany is also in an in, an instable situation. Uh, Olaf Scholz is one of the weakest chancellors in the post war history of Germany, and his coalition is is crumbling or is is really not doing well on the polls. And uh, the I mean, Italy's Meloni. I mean, these countries, the European the Europeans are at the moment thoroughly busy with themselves, with their own political processes. And the small ones like Switzerland, we have nothing to say. And we usually don't do, right? And we we, 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 we care for ourselves. Uh, and as in, the, like, all of the states, like, they're so busy with their own systems. And then, yeah. and then comes that war with in Ukraine and this visceral hate toward the Russians at the moment. Um, that worries me deeply because it's the one thing that I think the Europeans at the moment can, like a, a, a majority can agree upon that we all hate the Russians. And um, what do you think, like from like also your your discussions in France, what will this, what is this doing at the moment to the international, to the chances of an escalation of the war into a, a the fifth general European war in 400 years? Um, so I think the core issue at the end of the day is, um, in, in many ways, uh, European, I think a lot of, uh, EU politicians see themselves as having their hands tied, their, their hands are tied with NATO because it's a basic fact that, uh, we rely on the Americans to provide for our security. Uh, so if we, you know, um, go against NATO, uh, then that's factually bad for our own security, right? If we antagonize uh, the U.S., we've put ourselves in, in a situation where we're extremely dependent on on them. They, they, it's it's effectively a protection racket. Uh, right. Um, so their hands are tied with that, and then their hands are tied with uh, with Europe as well, uh, because there uh, there is so much power now concentrated in Brussels, and uh, you know if Brussels you know go against the country, they can they can really destroy it. Uh, we've seen that with Greece, Please. for instance. Uh, yeah, um, and and and. And when you look at NATO, it's of course uh, based on U.S. interest because the U.S. is the dominant power, which are very different from uh, European interests. Uh, and if you look at the EU, um, I mean, it's hard not to see, uh, not to believe that it is also. Uh, if you listen to Van der Leyen and so on, it's that they have. Uh, Europeans' interests uh, at heart. Uh, like, um, it's uh, like if you look at all their decisions, it's uh, if you had, if you really had Europeans' interests at, at heart, like, wh why would you do uh, all of this? Uh, so, uh, uh, Mario Draghi, for instance, recently uh, put a, a report on the, the state of. Uh, of the economy in uh, in Europe, and actually his his, di his diagnosis is is right on on many fronts. Like uh, on the economic front, he said like we've we've basically uh, been completely uh, uh, eaten uh, in the digital space uh, by uh, by the U.S. Like uh, there is no uh, uh, European company worth its salt. Uh, I think there was a crazy statistic like uh, for the past 40 or 50 years, uh, Europe hasn't created a single, uh, you know, major business, uh, uh, which, which is which is crazy when you think about it. Uh, yeah, it's crazy it compar was... compared to what the others are able to do. The Chinese can do it. The Russians can do it. Yeah. The Americans keep doing it. But we are digitally and innovation wise, we are completely, utterly, 100 percent like on the US, like dependent on the US, right? Yeah, like, yeah. No question. 
Yeah, exactly. And uh, and the 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 way to uh, uh, to that what we should have done to have avoided this situation is uh, uh, well, basically what uh, what what China did, did like they, they put this uh, great firewall to protect their their digital sovereignty, uh, which meant that they controlled uh, you know who could be in their market or. Or not, uh, they ensure that uh, those in their markets, uh, you know, respected their rules. It also enabled the emergence of a, a very good local e ecosystem and so on. So, if you looked from uh, Europe's, uh, uh, from from the perspective of European interests, that's the kind of stuff that 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 uh, that you want to do basically. So, you, you, whereas what we did is is basically. You know, we're we're a big happy family with the U.S. Like our door is wide open. Uh, all those companies, please come. And in uh, and, and the end, and, they they take everything. Yeah, but I mean, even in the markets where Europe used to be good, let especially the automotive industry, Europe is coming under the same sanctions as or similar sanctions as Chinese because the Americans have turned. A full scale protectionist, and they will only yeah. do more of that while still saying that uh, any kind of any kind of measures in in Europe you need to curb that down, and then the Euro Europeans do curb it down, and they and you have to increase all of your uh, all of your sanctions on China. So yeah. the the exactly. US, I mean, it, the, this is what 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 drives me crazy. I mean, the US yeah. has its interest, obviously, but that the Europeans yeah. don't get around to understand we can stand up for our own proper interests, yeah. and that's fine. And then we negotiate. Yeah. So so, so speaking at the European level, uh, to me, uh, one of the most striking historical things is uh, we uh, we were about to sign uh, uh, a few years ago. Uh, a very historical agreement with China called the, the, the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, uh, where which was negotiated between Europe and China during seven years, and uh, where China agreed to uh, you know things that were thought uh, impossible uh, because they were you know so favorable to uh, to to Europe's uh, interests. So, for instance. You know, no need for any joint venture anymore when uh, when European companies go to uh, to 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 the Chinese market. No need to relinquish uh, intellectual property. Um, uh, much more open in terms of uh, of industries that we should we, we could uh, you know uh, uh, set up business businesses for in China like a, a really really you know. Pretty good deal for for Europe, and everyone in Europe was uh, at least all the leaders were incredibly excited about that. At the time, it was uh, um, it was uh, still Merkel in in Germany, and uh, I think already Macron in in France. Uh, and the US was incredibly worried and annoyed about this deal, uh, calling it like a betrayal of of the US and uh, and so on and so forth. And um, Right during the election uh, of of Biden, right after Trump, in in the transition period, Europe tried to uh, kind of secretly, or, or maybe not secretly, but very discreetly, sign the agreement with China, and the entire Biden, the upcoming administration, like uh, Jake Sullivan and so on, like went went crazy on Europe, like writing op-eds after op-eds, going to Europe saying, you know, don't stab us in the back. Like they, they had that kind of, uh, of vocabulary. And so putting enormous pressure on Europe not to sign that agreement. Uh, and in the end, Europe came, they didn't. Um, and then right after the Biden administration came in, into power, they did a big thing around the... Uyghur genocide uh, narrative, and they convinced Europe to sanction uh, uh, Chinese officials for the the so-called genocide of the of the Uyghurs, and of, of course knowing that uh, China systematically retaliates uh, w when you sanction some of them, that sanction some of yours is diplomatic protocol in China, and so China retaliated on. Um, they sanctioned some uh, some uh, uh, members of the European Parliament, 
and and then uh, Europe said you sanction. How dare you sanction uh, our MEPs? It's uh, absolutely unacceptable. Uh, we share the comprehensive agreement on on investment. It's over. We're not going to sign it. Done. And it was over. Yeah. It, it hurts so much. It hurts so much because this could work much better and this could be so beneficial. And, you know, it's absolutely possible to work with China. And how do we know that uh, China and Switzerland have, actually have a free trade agreement? It's one of the benefits of not being in the EU. Switzerland often is kind of a testing ground for uh, also for Japan when they made when they wanted a free trade agreement with, with the EU. They first started with Switzerland. And once that was worked out, that became the basis for, you know, a negotiation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Luckily, that one still stands, actually. Um, I don't know how well it's working in practice, but... Um... So, I, I mean, I think from a, uh, a metaphor that I often give is, uh, is that of Lord of the Rings, you know? Uh, the reason why there's three rings of power is because with uh, one ring, it's uh, tyranny, because only one person has power, so they can impose whatever they want. With two rings, it's uh, conflict. When you have only two people in the game, it's always conflict. With three rings, it's balance. Um, and I think the uh, that Europe should be wise enough to understand that, uh, understand simply that the, the world would be a better place, uh, would be much more balanced and less conflictual if they played their role of uh, you know being a power in their own right, not uh, not simply bowing down to uh, to uh, to U.S. interests. Yeah, there's there's a sweet there's a sweet spot between being a evil colonizing power that subdues the rest of the world, or being a a split up uh, a polity that is is itself being colonized. I mean, there's a sweet spot between there where you just exist yeah. together with others. And yeah. um, I really wonder how no. we get there. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it's very hard. It's uh, I tend to think that there is e either too much Europe or not enough Europe. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> that's one of the primes. Uh, so it's either needs to be like actually a state uh, with its own sovereignty, its own uh, you know culture of sovereignty. Uh, uh, on, on, on so on and so forth, or we give it back to to the governments, to uh, to 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 the different countries in in uh, in, in Europe. But the the present situation, where it's kind of you know half a state, uh, half um, uh, yeah half a state Europe, and uh, but uh, it, it it just you know listens to what the uh, the US wants doesn't want to assert its power is extremely weak that that's clearly not working at all now yeah. and we will need more time to discuss um, why that is and maybe also compare it because there's other interesting uh, concepts around asean is one the the way that the african states are cooperating without integrating um, completely is another one um we should do we should do that but um i Want to be mindful of your time? You already gave me more than an hour. So Arnaud Bertrand, um, people can find you on Twitter, right? Yes. Everybody yeah. go to Twitter, Arnaud Bertrand. Yes, it's a, just type my name, Arnaud Bertrand, Twitter, and uh, you will find me. His All of his posts are very valuable because he does really, really good analysis. And, and it's just always a joy reading them. Arnaud, thank you very much. Thank you, Pascal.